One of the biggest challenges of space exploration is how much it costs just to get people up into space. In fact, there are many different companies in the commercial spaceflight industry that are solely focusing on that one issue, some of which being Rocket Labs, SpaceX, and Blue Origin. But in this series, I want to go in the background and history of Blue Origin, what they've been able to do, what ideas they've come up with, and what they aim to do in the future. So let's talk about that. Now before we get into the rocket science, we have to give a little bit of a background behind Blue Origin as a whole. And in fact, there are a lot of parallels between the formation of SpaceX and Blue Origin. Blue Origin was founded by Jeff Bezos, whereas SpaceX was founded by Elon Musk. Both Bezos and Musk were major players in the dot-com bubble, or in the early 2000s. More specifically, Jeff Bezos started a company in 1994 called Amazon.com, whereas Elon Musk started a company called X.com in 1999. Elon Musk actually made a lot of money over the three years from 1999 to 2002 when PayPal eventually bought his company and he earned $165 million. But Bezos' success didn't come as easily. In fact, in in 1999, his estimated net worth was $10 billion and eventually went down to $1.5 billion in 2002. And actually, at this time, when the dot-com bubble was starting to bust, some people predicting that Amazon could actually go bankrupt is when Jeff Bezos started Blue Origin. Now, some people have looked back and speculated, well, if Amazon wasn't doing so well at the time and he started a new commercial space flight company, was Blue Origin going to be his path to the future if Amazon were to fail? And we all know that Amazon didn't fail, and Bezos is now one of the most wealthiest people on Earth, but it is something that people have questioned over the last few years. Now with that being said, Bezos did have a passion for space exploration all the way back to when he was a kid. He actually was valedictorian of his high school and the local newspaper interviewed him saying what did he want to do when he grew up. And one of the biggest things is he wanted to make an impact having amusement parks, hotels, and just people being able to work in space, upwards of 1 to 2 million people. And if we look at Blue Origin's current plan, we see that they want to have a million or two million people living and working in space. Not necessarily on another moon or planet, but just maybe even in space stations, which is a little bit different from some of the other companies that we've been seeing. And as I mentioned in the beginning, one of the best ways they want to be able to make this realistic is by lowering the cost of orbit, meaning that they want to make more efficient launch vehicles or focus on reusability. Now before we go into the history and some of the early accomplishments of the company, we have to discuss what does Blue Origin mean? What does the name mean? And in fact, Bezos says, when we eventually go out into the solar system, explore new worlds, and just live amongst the stars, we will look back at our Earth as the Blue Origin, where we came from. Now the name Blue Origin for me kind of reminds me of Carl Sagan's pale blue dot quote. And if you've never heard it before, I recommend you checking it in the description below. Now the company has a coat of arms, it has a bunch of different symbolism and a motto to represent not only how they want to be able to achieve their goals, but also what their goals are. And if you want me to go into the actual symbolism of all of it, I could in another video, but just let me know down below. So let's start with the early history of Blue Origin. As I mentioned earlier, the company formed in late of the year 2000. However, there was no major announcement. In fact, many people only learned about the company in 2003 when they started acquiring land in Texas. And there wasn't a public announcement by Jeff Bezos until 2006, as we'll get to later. In fact, the whole first decade that the company existed, there really wasn't a lot of word about what they were planning on doing. And this is completely different to what SpaceX was doing. I mean, Elon Musk physically took a Falcon 1 rocket to Washington, D.C. because he was trying to raise awareness for commercial spaceflight as a whole. Now, something that we do know about the company in the early years as well in 2003 is that someone by the name of Rob Meyerson would join as the project manager of Blue Origin. And later he would say that the company when he joined only had 10 employees. In fact, Meyerson was mainly focusing on reusability of launch vehicles, which basically shows you what their ideas were for the early years. However, instead of creating a launch vehicle and then making it reusable, they focused solely on the reusability aspect and being able to vertically land. A different approach again to what SpaceX had done. Now it wouldn't be until 2005 when they would have completed their first vehicle. The name of this being Sharon, it was named after Pluto's the largest moon and the vehicle weighed 4300 kilograms and was powered by four vertically mounted jet engines not rocket engines jet engines that were created by rolls-royce now the first and only flight of sharon took place on march 5th of 2005 in fact it was fully autonomous they were testing their control sequence and it only reached an altitude of 96.3 meters 
But around the same time, they are also working on Blue Engine 1, which would be their very first rocket engine. And the acronym for that is BE-1. So BE-1 is actually a pressure-fed monopropellant rocket engine. Now, what does any of that mean? Well, first of all, monopropellant, mono meaning one, propellant meaning just the propellant that it needs. So it only uses one chemical in order to get the energy that it actually needs to create thrust. Pressure fed means it uses a completely different gas that has nothing to do with the reaction to basically push the chemical into the combustion chamber that's going to be creating the energy. But in this case, they don't have a combustion chamber or they aren't combusting. Instead, they're actually reacting with a catalyst. And this is because they're using hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide or H2O2 is two hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms that are all combined into one molecule. And as I mentioned, when they are combined with some form of catalyst, that actually causes them to react exothermically, which means they release a lot of energy and they form oxygen gas and water as a gas or steam. And in this sense, all that energy then pushes out the nozzle and creates the thrust it needs. Ultimately, each engine created 9.8 kilonewtons of thrust at a maximum. Now the purpose of BE-1 was to first of all show that Blue Origin can actually create a rocket engine, and second of all was to be used in Propulsion Module 1, or also known as Goddard. Now the vehicle Goddard is actually named after Robert Goddard, who is known as the father of rocketry. Many people made the comparison from aviation with the Wright brothers and rocketry to Goddard because he actually created the very first liquid-powered rocket in the 1920s and 1930s. But in terms of the vehicle as a whole, it was shaped like a cone and had nine BE-1 engines, but that is basically all we know about it. There was no major explanation of the specifications, how much it weighed, how tall it was, the diameter, none of that. All we know is it had nine engines and then it did a few test runs. Now because of the lack of information we have around the Goddard vehicle, we're gonna make some comparison to the McDonnell Douglas DCX vehicle that did something very similar in the mid 90s. And in fact, it has a very similar shape to what the Goddard looked like, but it's probably estimated to be a little bit bigger than what Goddard was. And this mainly has to do with its maximum thrust was around 240 kilonewtons, whereas when you calculate what Goddard's maximum thrust probably was, it was only around 88 kilonewtons. And since we know the specifications of DCX being around 12 meters tall and 4 meters in diameter, we could probably predict that the Goddard vehicle was much lighter and probably a lot smaller, maybe being around 1 to 2 meters in diameter and maybe like 4 to 5, maybe even 6 meters tall. But again, we really don't know because that hasn't been released. Now the first flight of the Goddard vehicle would take place on November 13th of 2006, which was around a year and a half after the Sharon flight, which is actually pretty impressive. Now as you can see in the video, Goddard ascended for 10 seconds reaching a maximum altitude of 87 meters. Then it had a controlled descent and landed 25 seconds into the flight. Now it didn't fly as high as Sharon did, but they did have a lot of successes on this flight. Not only was this their first launch with an actual rocket engine, because the other ones were jet engines, but they had created these rocket engines. They were the BE-1 engines. And in addition, this showed that they could successfully take off and land using rocket engines and the control algorithm that they had. And so far they were two for two in launches and landings, for at least that we know. Now this was such a big deal for the company that Bezos himself actually announced the success to the public. This being the first time that he recognized the company as a whole. And this is now a six year old company and this is the first time he publicized what they were doing and a little bit about what their plans were for the future. So it's kind of crazy that he went that long saying basically nothing about what they've been doing. Now there were two more launches following this one of the Goddard vehicle. One that took place on March 22nd of 2007 and another one taking less than a month later being April 19th of 2007, which is pretty impressive that they were able to fix it up and then launch it again within a month of the time frame. But we don't know this because the company told us, but people actually looked at the FAA records to see when these were actually happening. Therefore, none of this was public. This was all just within the company trying to see how well they could improve their system. So we don't know how high it went. We don't know anything about the mission or even have videos of it. All we know is that it happened. But that's not all we know about the Goddard vehicle. When Bezos came out and officially said what they were doing, he said, we're working patiently and step by step to lower the cost of spaceflight so that many people can afford to go, and so that we humans can better continue exploring the solar system. Accomplishing this mission will take a long time and we are working on it methodically. Now if you remember earlier in the video, I mentioned that Goddard is also called Propulsion Module 1. 
And this has to do with, this isn't just by itself. In fact, this was the very first test vehicle for their new Shepard project. Now, what is the new Shepard project and how were they able to develop it over a decade's time frame? That's what we're going to talk about in the next video. Now, thank you to everyone in the last video that pulled saying that they wanted to learn more about rocket science and basically the industry as a whole. And in fact, that's what this series kind of sparked from, both that and the history of SpaceX and a lot of comments I got from there. But if you want to see similar ideas, maybe more of the science behind rocket science or just general concepts in space, let me know in the comments below and I'd love to hear what you'd like to see. But thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.